So hello and welcome to the Royal Road to the weekly Royal podcast from ITV, where you can watch us on YouTube every week or you can listen to us on your favourite podcast platform. Hi, Lizzie. Hello. I said I've hello. To, I've seen I've you in the newsroom. I've managed to grab the studio this week. I got You've in got quite... the studio. I've got the uh, the office space near the stairwell. Um, but the studio literally is there. If, yeah. I, if I pop through this door, I'd be able to sort of um, say hello to you. But anyhow, uh, we are where we are. Um, the good news is we might be in the studio next week together uh, at a social distance. But um, apparently it's been uh, it's been looked at. It's the health and safety people have been in and we might be in the studio next week. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Could be good fun. Could be good fun. Um, so uh, what are we talking about this week? Uh, there's there's quite a lot of Cambridge stuff this week, isn't there? Actually, we, we should point out that we're talking on Archie's birthday. So happy birthday, Archie. Uh, Harry and Meghan have asked you to donate uh, $5 to um, vaccine equity. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. So happy birthday to Archie. It's his birthday as we record this. Two years old. Can you, can you believe that? Two can years you, old. I mean, two years. It seems like I mean, I don't know where the time's gone. It seems like only five minutes ago we were preparing for uh, the coverage around his arrival and um, being in Windsor for that announcement. So, it was on uh, a Monday, wasn't it? It was a, it was, um, a it was bank, bank holiday, holiday a public holiday on the Monday. And that's when it all happened in the, in the morning. And then there was all that chat about, oh, they announced that she was in hospital after she'd actually given birth. But anyway, we went, we went rake over old ground. <laughs> yeah, and then we, had, we didn't get the normal... We didn't get the uh, traditional uh, photo on the steps, did we? We had to wait till a few days later and they introduced him to us at St George's Hall yes. uh, at Windsor Castle. Someone else had a birthday this week though as well, cousin. Uh, uh, little Princess Charlotte uh, turned six and she's not looking quite six. so little anymore. She looked no. really grown up in that uh, picture. That Another they... picture by Kate. As is the tradition now, um, she takes them and they release them. Um, and lots, of people said, will... lots of people said that they thought uh, Charlotte looked like the Queen and looked like Prince William. Um, but I oh. I couldn't really see it. But um, but there was lots of chatter on social media about how she... Yeah, she I saw that. Her. Yeah, and actually, funny enough, you mentioned social media and uh, William and Kate didn't put it on social media because actually William and Kate's uh, social media accounts, Instagram, Twitter were taking part in the social media boycott over the public holiday weekend uh, over the issue of um, the what well, the allegation that the social media companies aren't doing enough to combat racism, particularly in football. So lots to talk, talk about. Do you want to do the rundown, give everyone a quick, quick run through of everything that's happened this week, and then we can do more Cambridge stuff? Uh, so this week, uh, Kate and William launched a new YouTube channel. So they already have an Instagram account and a Twitter account, and now they have gone live on YouTube with a uh, fancy little introductory video. And then uh, today we got their first uh, proper material. Which we'll um, play you the fancy video if you stay with us. We will. And uh, their first uh, video, their first sort of proper video was all around Hold Still, which is uh, the Duchess of Cambridge's photography project that she launched during the pandemic to kind of create a snapshot of the, uh, the country during uh, lockdown. And the uh, her book is going on, is published tomorrow, which is just when this podcast goes live. So uh, Friday the 7th. Uh, the Prince of Wales this week, he visited the uh, the Welsh Guards at their barracks and he did so in his role as uh, their colonel, um, a role that he took over from his father in 1975 and they took part in the uh, the funeral and uh, Prince Charles was, uh, was there meeting them and seeing them but he also paid uh, tribute to how kind of enormously touched he was by their role in the funeral. Uh, Megan this week uh, announced that uh, she has uh, written her first children's book and we saw a little uh, teaser from that. We had an update on her court case against the Mail on Sunday. Uh, Princess Charlotte, as you say, she turned six and Prince William joined the social media boycott over the weekend. And someone was at a concert, vaccines. Harry and Meghan were at a concert and... Yeah. Well, we only uh, saw Harry, but apparently we will see Meghan when, it, when it's broadcast on the 8th of May, uh, but uh, that's this weekend. And uh, just for the full rundown, uh, as you say, Archie turns two today, which is the 6th of May. 
Rundown tastic. Well, well done. Um, so I suppose I'm going to read you this from my TikTok um, because I'm having a little experiment on the old TikTok uh, okay. device. And apparently, skip ad. Um, Do you think Kate and William are around like it, uh, Right. Well, this is interesting because they might follow my lead. They when it might. Comes to they might. Yeah. So according to my TikTok uh, channel, because I transcribe this, by the way, you be careful what you say now because you know they are filming. Now, who said what? Who said that to whom? That was uh, William saying that to uh, to Kate at the start of their uh, their little promo for their new YouTube channel. So let's have a look. By the way, you'll be careful what you say now because these guys, they're filming. I know. <laughs> Do you need to roll your arm? Do I not, do you not roll it? No. So that was William and Kate on YouTube. Um, they've also posted something else on YouTube uh, today, which um, I suppose you could call it their, is that their second post or their first post? The first one felt like the introduction. Now, the first thing that they did um, was to do with Kate's Hold Still project. Um, and they released a conversation that we had. Now, do you remember when we spoke to a little girl called Mila? four years old, uh, battling leukaemia. She was one of the finalists in the, in the Hold Still project. If you remember that, they um, released a little uh, telephone conversation that Kate had with Mila. What was it, Lizzie? About six months ago now, I suppose. Yeah, they said that the, the phone conversation happened in the autumn. So it was a little while ago. Um, but uh, we know from her mum that there was one very excited little girl at the, uh, at the end of the the phone wasn't there. Yeah, and I had to keep it quiet for a very long time. I just did a little, give you a little reminder. So here's the picture that, uh, so you can only see this if you're watching on YouTube, of course, but uh, if you're not, if you're running, as I always say, you can go onto our social media channels at ITV News Royals on Instagram is a good place to find it, or on Twitter, you'll find me at Chris Ship ITV. This is the finalist. This is the, the still, the photo that became uh, one of the 100 finalists in the hold still, which is going to be in a book. Now, this is all kind of tying together. The YouTube, the book, the photo, the conversation with Mila. It's all coming together, isn't it? All coming together. And this photo that you're looking at, uh, you can see Mila is at the window and the other side of the window is her father, Scott. And um, because Mila uh, has a rare form of leukaemia during the, uh, the first lockdown, they really had to protect her and shield her. And because dad, Scott, was still going to work, um, he had to actually live separately uh, with Mila's sister um, uh, away from the family for, for a good few weeks. And yeah, uh, Mila at the time, I think, was only four. Yeah, I remember watching it at the time, actually, when it went out on the news. It was one of our colleagues up in Scotland, uh, Peter, who did the story first of all. And I just remember feeling so sorry for her. It was such a moving, um, moving film that he, uh, he produced from there. We, however, were lucky enough to catch up with uh, Mila when she became one of the finalists. This is a little clip of a conversation that I had with her when she told me how a real life princess, as she put it, had picked her picture. Do you know about your picture? Tell us yeah. about it. So there's a real life princess who picked my picture. The queen knows about everything. See, everyone in this whole entire world will see my picture. And as you can see, uh, right there on my screen, where is she on your screen, Lizzie? That way? That way? Yeah. You're that way, okay. Hi, uh, Mila's with us now. Hi, Mila. You wait, to everyone. Yeah. Hey, and Linda, her mum's with us. Thank you both very much for being here. Uh, listen, you've been having a chat with the princess, haven't you, Mila? Yes. Now tell me all about that. Well, first, um, um, I asked her, are you wearing a costume? Ah. Now I take it. Let's let's have a chat about that. What, Lizzie? What is your favourite colour? Oh, I think my favourite colour would be blue, but I think Mila's favourite colour might be different. Uh, I'm 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 going to go green. What's yours? Pink. Pink. Okay. Now, what is it that you want, Kate, the Duchess of Cambridge, the princess? What is it you want her to wear when you meet her next? A pink dress. <laughs> And she said she would, didn't she? She said that she would. Do you have a costume? I'm not wearing a princess costume right now, I'm afraid, <laughs> Mila. Do you have lots of dressing up outfits yourself? Yes. Yeah? Yes. What's your favourite colour? Pink. Pink, okay. Well, I have to make sure. 
have to make sure I go and try and find myself a pink dress. So that <laughs> hopefully, when one day, hopefully, me, we'll get to meet, and then I'll remember to wear my pink dress for you. Yeah. Tell us about the pink dress then. You want Kate to wear a pink dress, yes? Yeah. Good. Well, I think she should, don't you, Lizzie? Definitely think she should. And she promised, so I think, I think she would. Exactly. Uh, Lindy, when did you have this conversation with um, the Duchess of Cambridge? It was about six months ago, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Um, I think around October time. Right. I was did you know four they were... then. I you was were four, four then. then, so hold on. How old are you now? Five. Five? Five. Uh, I've lost count of how many fingers I am. I'm sort of up here <laughs> somewhere. So, <laughs> so um, how did you keep it quiet for all that time? That was really difficult. Secret. Um, obviously, I was able to talk to Scott about it, but um, yeah, that was not an easy secret to keep. <laughs> did you know it was going to end up on their new YouTube channel? Um, I didn't at that time. Um, Hold on a minute, we've got to pause the conversation to oh, something important. We've What's got a this? Picture, yeah. When the sun sets. This is a picture oh. I can see Josie, Dad, Mum, and Mila. When did you paint this? Um, I painted it on Thursday. Thursday. Last Thursday. Week. Wow. Now tell everyone that you've uh, you've um the reason why. Kate, the princess, knows about you is because of your picture with your dad, yeah? Mm -hmm. But also, mm -hmm. you've just you've just been in hospital for more treatment, haven't you? Yeah. Were you being brave? Always brave. Mum, she's always brave, isn't she, Linda? She has. She's had, a, she's had a tough week. She was in on Monday for a PCR COVID test back in Seattle on Tuesday and a wee unexpected trip um, today as well for Croup. So um, she's doing a tough week. That's that's pretty tough. Uh, Mila, do you want to tell us about the new person in your house? What's his name? Luna. Luna? I thought it was called Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole is your other dog. Oh, you got two dogs? She's got a new dog since then. Oh. I believe, so. Hold on one second. Two dogs in the house. <laughs> Linda, um, the, the conversation that you had with Kate, I thought was it was it was lovely, wasn't it? Because uh, it sort of brought everything together. The book's coming out tomorrow. I take. Have you had, had a copy of it yet? Not yet. Um, I believe right. they're sending them out, so right. um, it'll so be nice to see that. You're in there. You're one of the hundred finalists. Um, you've had the chat with Kate. It's gone all over their YouTube channel. There's millions of people listening to it. So, what do you think about it all, um, Mila? Are you happy? Yeah, I'm happy. And tell me, did you like your conversation with the princess? Yeah. Yeah? Now, what are you going to say to her when you meet her? I want to meet her kids. And, Mila, you, you told Kate, didn't you, the princess, that you know the names of all three of her kids, don't you? I know but, one of her names. <laughs> Do you? What are their names? Can you remember? Yeah. <clears throat> what are their names? Charlotte. Yes. Who else? George. That's George, well done. And there's one more. Louis. Yay. <laughs> Louis got so big now, he's very quick running around and he's on his little scooter as well. He's very quick. I can't keep up with him. <laughs> you like to go on your scooter too, don't you? Yeah. Now I've got a question for you. You know, when we first met you, um, or one of one of my friends met you called Peter, he found out that you were big fans of Anton Deck. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Ant and Dec. So, who would you rather meet, Ant and Dec or the princess in the pink dress? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's, tough That's tough. That's a tough one. How about just say all of them? Yeah. <laughs> That's really good. Uh, listen, um, you've you've been brave this week in hospital. Um, so, uh, are you looking forward to um, seeing your picture in this new book that's coming out? Has Mummy told you about the new book? Yeah. 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 Mila, Mila, do you remember when you had the photo taken? Tell us where, why, why Daddy's one side of the window and why you're the other. Do you remember why? Do you want to tell us? Because I had to self-isolate because Daddy wanted to keep me safe. Yeah, yeah. But Daddy's home now, isn't he? So you're all he's together work, again. He's at work. He's at work. That? He's at work now, isn't he? But when Daddy came back into the house, you gave him a really big cuddle? That's good, isn't it? So i tell you what, we need to work out how we can get you and the princess to meet, don't we? 
How much would you like to meet the princess? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Anyone who's not watching on YouTube, you might be listening to this podcast while you're um, in your ears. Mila just put out her hands really, really wide to say what? Lots and lots and lots. I love her so much. <laughs> you love her so much. <laughs> Mila, have you, have you been able to tell your friends yet that you had a phone call from the princess? Wow. What did your friends say? I don't think they believed her. She went into school the day after the phone call and um, she had told her teacher that she, I was speaking to the princess and it was very much like, oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. <Yeah. laughs> well, but yeah. she I suppose you just went, mm, mm, mm. You said <laughs> she spoke say. to you for about 20 minutes, didn't you, Linda? Yeah, we initially got the call to say that she would spend just a couple of minutes um, chatting with some of the finalists yeah. and it lasted yeah. around 20 minutes in total. So. Yeah. Um, it was really kind of her to spend and you know so much of her time um, chatting with us. So, Mila, what did you say to the princess when you picked up the phone? Because I just listened to it this morning. What did you say to her? What did you say? Good morning. Good, Good morning, morning, Your Royal Highness. Good morning, Your Royal Highness. <laughs> Good morning, my goodness me, you're so polite, Mila. <laughs> you're more polite than me. <laughs> Listen, we look forward to seeing you yes. in the book. That means yes. That means yes, we can do that. <laughs> um, we look forward to seeing you in the book and um, thank you for speaking to us, even though you've been in hospital today. It's been really lovely to see your face and you're looking really well. Yep, look at that. You look really good. Um, Congratulations, well done, and well done for being so brave. Eh? You're a brave girl. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we Bye, hope Mila. we can see you soon in person. Oh, show us your picture again. Love that picture. Yeah, definitely want that on my wall. Is that okay? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thanks, Mila. I'll give you a kiss as well. Lovely to see Mila again. It's always a pleasure to see her. And what a brave little girl. I mean, every time I see her, I'm just amazed by her bravery and, and you know, the journey that she's on with her mum. And we wish them all very well indeed. Um, and we should continue our Cambridge news. There's been a lot of it this week. We mentioned at the very top about this, uh, this social media boycott. So basically, Princess Charlotte's picture, because her birthday fell on a Sunday, uh, wasn't put up at all by the uh, Cambridges because they were taking part in that boycott to encourage, cajole, force social media companies to do more to combat racism, particularly in sport. Um, but I think it was a nice picture, wasn't it? Boycott, when it came? Was, boycott was general online abuse, I think, wasn't it? To persuade kind of tech giants to take a stronger stance on abuse. So um, yes. he joined he joined that in his role as, as president of the, uh, the exactly. FA. Yeah, but it was a lovely picture. But I mean, the, the picture that didn't make it onto their social media channels did make it into all the newspapers and broadcasters. Um, so uh, here it is. I mean, if you're watching, if you're not, if you're listening, then you know where to go. Instagram, ITV News Royals. But uh, a lovely picture taken by Kate in Norfolk just last week. So a very recent picture as well. Yeah, taken, um, taken at the weekend. And she suddenly looks really grown up, doesn't she? Um, uh, but yeah, six. And uh, we know from comments that William made during a visit to the West Midlands this week that she uh, she had a lovely day and that they had one other family over, which uh, is the rules at the moment. You can either have two households or groups of six outside. And he said that uh, she's growing up very fast, which I think is true. If you look at that picture, she does look uh, a lot older. Absolutely. What was Louis the other week? Three, wasn't he? Louis, Louis three. was three. Louis spot. three, Archie's two, Charlotte's six, George's eight, I guess. Seven. 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 Right. You'll know better than me. Um, I'll I'll bow to your greatest knowledge. Isn't George's birthday coming up? It's like a June, July birthday. Am I right? Wrong? Coming up, yes, coming up. Good, good. <laughs> <laughs> As that's you saying you don't know, isn't it? <laughs> I'm agreeing with you. I just said it's coming agreeing up. It's coming up. Good, good. I'm agreeing um, with you. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, so the, 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 the Cambridge's YouTube, the social media ban, there was the birthday. What else we had from the Cambridge's this week? Uh, oh, William's visit, he went up to Aston Villa, his football club. Did, his football club, he went yeah. there and, and he did a, a oh, so, Yeah, and then the, then the book, Hold Still. 
and then the book holds still a busy week for them. I thought their um their new YouTube is very slick though, isn't it? Uh, a, a very polished, a bit like the video we saw. Actually, it came out when we were kind of mid recording last week. Their um their video of the family to mark uh, ten years of marriage. We were sort of yeah, recording that... and like, oh, something's happening. Yeah, that video. Uh, some people said it felt like a you know a John Lewis advert or an advert for sort of barber outdoor wear or something it was very slick indeed wasn't it very it, it just yeah. that was to commemorate to, to mark their 10th anniversary wasn't it yeah very very slick very polished and uh, as i think this uh youtube one is you know they've got a digital team that work with them and mm. uh um actually it was a, a filmmaker called will war that did their one for uh their anniversary but i think their digital team have done their youtube video and they've um it's always nice seeing they, they've done a montage uh looking back at things that have done it's always nice seeing things that we've kind of trips yeah. that we've been on and events that we've been at and stories we've covered so to go from something very modern uh which is youtube and videos to something a bit less modern which is a book full of words we've been joined by a friend of this podcast we say you're a friend of this podcast uh, jobo robert jobson evening standard um man of abc news what else author um author? royal correspondent Royal yes, correspondent of three long. decades. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, Jobo. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, Chris. Lovely to see you. We haven't seen you in person for a long time, but um, this is the best we can do for now. I think the last time we saw Jobo was uh, at the Duchess of Cornwall engagement at the club in London. Oh, we, we went. Oh, that was good. That was good. That was, good. That, yeah. was good. And that, that, yeah. that brilliant singer, wasn't there? She was a brilliant singer. And that, and the Duke, the Duke and Duchess, or the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall, tapping their feet, and to that singer who had a beehive like he had in the sixties. In, in some, yes, in some underground club just off Oxford Street in central London, wasn't it? So uh, well, that's we'll the last have to meet there again person. when it's open. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And have a few drinks. Um, now, listen, the reason we're talk, uh, we've uh, invited you on, A, um, I understand from looking at some of your social media posts that you might have a new publication. Uh, I do, Chris. And uh, it's, it's already out, and thank you very much for mentioning it. I really appreciate it. Yep. It's called, That's and right. here we go, the, the, the cheap plug, get it over. It's called Prince Philip's Century. Prince Philip's Century. 1921 to 2021, The Extraordinary Life of the Duke of Edinburgh, which... Um, now, listen, I'm, there's been... There's been there's been a lot of conversations, obviously, about the Duke of Edinburgh um, and his legacy ever since um, we had the news. Uh, just what two, three weeks ago now? I sort of forget how long it is. Um, yeah. Uh, so sometime in April, so I can remember. Ninth of April. Um, so what? And you've called it the century, even though he he only reached. I say only reached. He reached the age of ninety nine. He would have been a hundred in June. Uh, but as you rightly point out, a century is nineteen twenty one to twenty twenty one, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I was hoping, like many people were hoping, that he would make it to his 100th birthday. And I started work on this uh, tome um, on my birthday, actually, on the first lockdown, and um, was writing it with that, in that hope that we would be celebrating his 100th birthday. But unfortunately... But you started writing it on your 21st birthday, or your... Uh, no, my, my birthday on the 23rd of March. Um, right, on I the thought first, when you were... On the, the first lockdown. And, um, You're a youngster. Yeah, and but I actually found it really interesting the research into it because um, you know, like a lot of people have said after the coverage of his um, funeral, which was very deeply moving, I thought, and brilliantly executed, um, that they learned a lot more about the Duke of Edinburgh than they'd really known before. They'd seen him as this cro yeah. crotchety old, almost caricature um, of himself. Now, both you and I, fortunately, visits with him and and watched him very close up over the years. And yeah, you know, I, I mean, I started doing this in 1990. So, you know, he was in his, well, you know, he was just, he was a working role then, but he was, he, you know, he wasn't the same character as he was in his, in his 90s. But I, I found him fascinating when I started researching all sorts of elements about his life, um, from his um, working side of his life, to his childhood, to his, well, you know, it's his affairs of the heart, mm. all sorts of areas, and he's interested in art and painting and science and religion. I found him a fascinating man, and you could see quite clearly, not only was he a very handsome man, was a young man, um, but you can see why the Queen fell in love with him, actually, um, you know, in a yeah. way that um, 
you know, he was really quite a remarkable man. And that's why I say a remarkable life, because he was a remarkable man. And I found it really fascinating, yeah. I mean, I mean a lot's been written about him, you know, over the years. Um, what have you found new about Prince Philip that even people like Lizzie and I, with our wisdom and knowledge, uh, didn't know? Well, there are a number of things. I mean, you get you get, you get wrapped up in it, so you forget what is new, what isn't new. But I, I got into delved into the archives, and I found some of the, um, the missives from the ambassadors fascinating, where they'd all have bits redacted. Um, he was um, there was one particular anecdote that always made me smile. That he was one person that would really um, be able to put the Queen. Uh, um, uh, which would speak to the Queen in a way that others would never be able to. And I remember there was one instance he was in on one of the, in the on a tour of the Caribbean and couldn't wait to get onto the uh, the Royal Yacht Britannia. And uh, the Queen was dutifully shaking the hands of all the officials and doing what she does really very well. He'd had enough of all this. He'd been there a few days. I think it was on Belize. He'd had enough, and so he just went ahead of all this. Went on the plate the, the, on the on the ship. They piped him aboard, and then he stood on the deck they started shouting at the queen yak 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 that's quite enough of that we've got to go now and, and <laughs> she looked at, up at him and if looks could kill but this was all recorded in a missive in the foreign office which i found fascinating that, the, that it had all been written down and also some of the things some that she had to transcribe that <laughs> yak 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 you know a couple yak, of women. yak yak uh, but he was he was some um, remark i mean there was another incident that i in the book that i found very funny was that um, I'd spoken to uh, was various, you know, off the record, uh, not off the record, but not for, for naming the sources. And there was one incident uh, at Balmoral when he was on holiday, he was very much on holiday. Okay, so he was at Balmoral, but he'd be up at five in the morning. You know, he's at this very active character up at five, six a.m. And long before the piper had piped the Queen's, uh, the, the, the Queen's piper had uh, woken her up with the, with the pipes. And so just below his, his uh, wind, her window, he's ha he starts this huge row with his personal protection officer who was allocated to him. And he said, well, what are you doing? I don't want, I don't need you, I'm on holiday. And the, the protection officer said, well, I've, I've been assigned to you, sir, today. And she said, oh, yeah, give me the key. No, 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 I don't need you. So... The, the, the officer, who's a former Royal Marine, decided to walk off with the keys, which let, sent him into an explosion of foul-mouthed abuse at this officer. At which point, uh, it was about sort of 5.30 in the morning, Her Majesty opens the window, out, and she says, Philip, what on earth is the matter? And, and then he, then he realised he'd overstepped the mark. He, he starts shouting at the protection officer to come back, get in, get in the car, get in. And so eventually they have to drive off with the officer. So he knew... <laughs> he knew there were limits, and when the queen, when the queen wasn't very happy, she only had to say a couple of words, and he knew he'd overstep the mark. But you know, at the end of the day, he said very many things, and one of the ones that stood out for me um, was he said, "Well, the secret of a happy marriage." And I wish I'd learned this. I've given my track record. He said, "The secret of a happy marriage is to spend a lot of time apart and to have very different interests." <laughs> well, actually, he also and in Sorry, I was going to say he also, I mean, one of the things that the Queen loved so much about him was that he didn't tiptoe around her. Everyone else treated her like the Queen or a princess. He treated her as Elizabeth. And that, that is what she, um, why she loved him so yeah, much. Yeah, but he knew, knew not to stories. overstep the mark, even with his wife. Yeah, those stories there was, really The thing that. is, Lizzie, I've heard a lot about, well, some of our esteemed colleagues talking about two steps behind. Most of the time when he was on these trips, he'd be wandering off. No, it was a bit like Chris just before he got on a royal plane, got on a royal tour. He came wandering off, bus. you know, just and where is he? No one knows where he is. And that's what the Duke would do. He would be two steps behind him, oh. off somewhere else, yeah. checking you, you, things out. You remind us was, of royal tours, Jobbo. We haven't done one of them for a long time. Oh, I think it's going to be a while, mate. But the um, there was another thing that was very made me. I mean, he, once the Queen was appalled the Royal Yacht Britannia, and he was ranting so much, shouting so much about something or other that the Queen locked herself in the in the in the um, the cabin, and her private secretary, later Lord Charters, then Sir Martin Charters, or Martin Charters, said, "Said Your Majesty, you've got to come out." She said, "I'm not coming out until he's calmed down, and I'm not coming out until he stops shouting." <laughs> <laughs> It's great, isn't it? Even the Queen. And uh, listen, you you watched the uh, funeral. Uh, we all thought it was um, 
you know what I, we said this last week didn't we but this is this was the, the slimmed down funeral and yes it was quite a spectacular moment wasn't it in, in Windsor uh, and we're just gonna have a quick listen to um what Prince Charles said about it this week because uh, the Prince of Wales was uh, doing a visit in Windsor. He was visiting uh, the Welsh Guards, part of the household division. Uh, yeah. And this is how he thanked them for the role that they played in that spectacular. In fact, I think the Prince referred to it as the very dignified and beautiful funeral. Have a listen. I was um, so enormously proud of those of you who uh, formed part of the uh, compliment during my father's funeral recently, and uh, if I may say so, it was a wonderful credit, uh, not only to the Welsh Guards, but also to the Household Division and all those who were on parade that day for what you all did. Uh, I know my family and I were deeply moved by the way you all performed your duty. And uh, people from other countries rang me up to say that they'd never seen anything quite so marvelous and so beautifully done and with such dignity and style. There's been quite a lot of talk, hasn't there, Jobber, about the relationship between Charles and Philip, particularly over the sort of the sort of latter years and how it's changed. How do you think it's changed? Oh, it was certainly quite difficult in the early years. I think that um, the Duke of Edinburgh, rightly or wrongly, felt that he wanted to toughen up his son. He had a certain way that he felt that going to Gordonston, for example, would be was good for him. It would be good for his son. And Prince Charles would probably be benefited from going to Eton. There's no doubt about that, which would have been the Queen Mother and the Queen's choice. Um, the relationship was difficult. There's no doubt about that. They both share... They always loved each other, but they were very different in their outlooks on all sorts of things, from organic farming to areas of their personal life. And I think that really um, when the marriage broke down with Charles and Diana, Philip initially sort of tried very hard to persuade Diana to stay. That led to conflict with his son. And it wasn't really until the last 10 years of their life, I think, of his life, that they began to sort of agree to disagree on areas. They were they were certainly much closer um, in the last ten years of the, of yeah. the life, and also particularly when he after he retired. Yeah, I, I th I'd agree with that. I mean, they, they were getting closer, weren't they? And actually, I suppose that the one person that went in to see Prince Philip in hospital when he was in there for that extended four week period uh, was Prince Charles, and obviously he left there looking very emotional. He looked very emotional on the funeral day as well. Um, Oh, he and did. He looked he, like the world of the world and, you know, yeah, landed it's, on his shoulders. I felt for him. I have no doubt. I mean, we, I mean Chris, both of us, and we're all of us, you know, poised and, and, and worried about the, this, the the amount of time the Duke spent in hospital and um, uh, certain times when he came in that, out in that wheelchair, you know, we all felt that this was a different moment from when he'd mm. walked out before. And, and I think that the Prince of Wales was clearly very emotional when he left the hospital. They'd had a, a conversation that only father and son will know about. I mean, there were lots of speculation of what they would have talked about. A lot of people, I mean, I spoke to said they were he was talking about things about the line of succession and but per issues too, you know, like making sure Her Majesty was looked after, all of these sort of things. But only the father and the son can ever really know what was said. But I, from what I can understand, um, you know, the, this was a. This was not some sort of rapprochement in the relationship. The relationship was pretty good until then. The prince used to always write to his father. I remember sitting in the plane, on the plane coming back from Vanuatu, on the, the Australian Prime Minister's plane, when I was invited in to talk to the prince for twenty-five minutes or so. And there on the desk was he was right. He'd been writing a letter to his father, and I could see that. Um, and so there was a very a very important line of communication between father and son. And, you know, he knew that the bottom line now is Charles, whether or not becomes a regent, which he, I personally think it was in the, was certainly in the mind of the queen. He's now the patriarch of the family, you know, and yeah. it's, and he is the man who will carry out the state visits when they start happening again. Effectively, there won't be state visits, but you know, because he's only the Prince of Wales, but 
really now they are for state visits. So and actually, next week, or is it on the 11th of um, May, we've got the state opening of Parliament, didn't we? Um, which, you know, a long time ago and for many, many years was um, the Queen arriving at the House of Lords entrance with, or the Sovereign's entrance of the Houses of Parliament with her consort. Uh, and it was only in latter years that it's been, she's been accompanied by, um, by the Prince of Wales. And that's something we're going to see more and more, just like we do at the Cenotaph. Just, you know, this is a, a process that's now going to be accelerated, isn't it? Oh, I, without doubt, Chris, and, and I think that it has to, because of course, you know, he is the patriarch, he's the chief supporter, he is, he now is her liege man, he's also the Duke of Edinburgh as well, because he's inherited his father's title. Yeah, so. I did just explain it for anyone who doesn't understand that, because the, the Duke of Edinburgh's title goes to the next most senior person, doesn't it, which is the Prince of Wales. Well, it goes um, to his son, yeah, it goes, well, yeah. It, goes to, it goes to his oldest son. Um, but he's already got plenty of titles, the Duke of Rossi, the Duke of Cornwall, the Prince of Wales. I know, but they've all got titles, haven't they, yeah. Chris? I mean, the bottom line is when the Prince of Wales becomes king, uh, it's expected, and it probably will happen, that the Duke, um, the Prince of Wales will then, uh, as the Duke of Edinburgh, as Prince Philip wished, will make Prince Edward the Duke of Edinburgh. I'm yeah, pretty sure definitely. that will happen. Yeah. And actually, Prince Edward did a visit this week. He was at a, a school in Guildford in Surrey, a, a school that um, the Duke of Edinburgh himself had opened. Uh, they sent us some pictures uh, of the of the visit. Um, and it's, I think it's just important to remember, again, that, you know, this wasn't that long ago, 2009, I think it was, him opening a school. Uh, you know, he was only retired from the age of 97 in 2017. I mean, this man worked and worked and worked. And there aren't many people who are doing visits and jobs like that, particularly not in the public eye, at that grand old age. Well, even last summer, even though he was retired in July 2020, we saw him doing that engagement with the rifles in the quadrangle of Windsor Castle that he very much wanted to mm -hmm. do. We know that he was writing. He had hundreds of patronages and organisations he was still involved with. He um, was. And he was still writing to them, keeping in contact with them. Um, so, you know, even though he was 99, he was still incredibly active and involved. So, Joe, what's your prediction then I'm, going forward? Mine? Um, yeah. Well, I, I mean, mean, I, I, well, I, when I we, think... When are we going to get royal tours back? Who's going to do them? Where are they going to go? <laughs> these, these are things uh, you want yeah, to do. I, I think that royal tours will come back um, probably next year, earliest. Um, I think the Prince of Wales would be the first to be involved. I know, I mean, although the palace was trying to play this down, he's very keen to meet Prince Charles, Joe Biden, because he sees in him a kindred spirit when it comes to mm. when it comes to the the sustainable the, the, the world. Well, really, actually, after, we haven't. After, you, you raised an interesting point there because Joe Biden's coming over for the G seven summit, which is happening in the southwest. Yeah, of but England. that's a G seven summit. Cornwall. That's different. But, but, but you know, would there be any sort of royal involvement in that? Would there be some visits well, around I know, it? You know, would he know, pop in I, to see Prince Charles on on his way over there? Well, it's possible, but I mean, you know, G seven summits and very busy times and. I know that the Prince is keen to discuss the world with Joe Biden because, of course, he spent a long time discussing it with Donald Trump, probably to no avail. Um, yeah, yeah. But, um, do you remember, do you you remember know, that he, meeting that uh, Prince Charles and Donald Trump had in Clarence House when it, it was clearly not a meeting of minds? And uh, did, did you remember Camilla? Didn't she give a little wink or a little smile at the end? Apparently, of he did spend the thing that was quite interesting about that is that actually he did was going to, he spent a, I think the Trump respected his views. Um, even though they disagree with them. I think that was the point. Whereas I think Joe Biden, somebody who's probably somebody who would listen a bit more to the Prince of Wales. Look, America is a great polluter. Um, you know, yeah. that's what they do. Yeah. Um, they, they're, they're not gonna they're not gonna stop polluting just for the sake of what the Prince of Wales says. But you know, this pandemic has been proven, you know, um, is proof in the pudding that you've got to start listening to nature. And that's what Prince Charles was saying in his book Harmony all those years ago when he wrote it. It's extremely important that we listen. And we and we uh, we embrace nature rather than bulldoze over it. And I think that's really important. I think that um, the West Indies is due to be visited because, of course, there's a lot of the realms there that need to be seen. Although we did um, the visit to Cuba, Barbados and we did all those wanting islands. to to split. Don't forget, yeah. Well, that's right. They well, not do, just split, they, at least, and not have the Queen as the the head of state. Yeah, and they probably will achieve that at some stage. They're a very rich rich um, realm and I'm sure that that will happen. Canada is due to a, a visit at some stage but we've got less royals now of course we've got we've got yeah. the California royals that um, Meghan Markle stroke Meghan Duchess of Sussex stroke 
Meghan, Princess Henry, whatever she's called these days, whatever title she doesn't want to use. Um, I would have just called it, just called it Megan. She's the most famous Megan in the world. And, and she has a new um, book, which uh, we've got to talk about um, as well yeah. uh, in, in, in this podcast. But your book, by the way, is now out. So Prince Philip of Century. Show it one more time. Uh, there we go. Uh, With pictures by, there's pictures by Mr. Arthur Edwards MBE as well. Well, we, we all like Arthur Edwards. Uh, big fan of this podcast. So uh, from the Prince Philip, who was the great grandfather of... Archie, is that right? Kind of right? Yes, he's right. <laughs> um, and Archie, who has turned two, as we told you at the top of this podcast. Remember last year, you might remember that video, Duck, Duck, Rabbit. Hey, look, a duck. That's not a duck. That's a rabbit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, can you turn the page? What happens after that? Are you kidding me? It's totally a duck. It's for sure a rabbit. Just a reminder what they did for his first birthday. So on the second birthday, uh, we had instead um, Harry and Meghan appealing on their website, the archerwell.com website, for people to donate five dollars to uh, to promote vaccine equity, as they call it. So um, if you if you go to Archerwell, there's a link on their website that takes you to globalcitizen.org, where you can. It's kind of connected to this Vax Live thing that Harry did at the weekend, where you can. Um, you can donate five dollars because as Megan and Harry point out, yes, millions and millions of people have been vaccinated, but most of those people are in wealthier countries. Yeah, Archwell, their, uh, their non-profit organisation is working in partnership with Global Citizen and uh, the Vaccine Alliance. And for every uh, five dollars that is uh, donated, they uh, that will be matched. So um, so. I think if you give five dollars, it will turn into actually twenty. Turn into twenty, yes. Yeah. So they've obviously got uh, other people to match that that amount, haven't they? Because uh, Harry, have we shown people the, the video of Harry on stage at the Vax Live events? Yes. No, we haven't, have we? No. No. Okay. Have a watch. Vax Live campaign chair Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex. Hi, everybody. in the global fight against COVID-19. Tonight is a celebration of each of you here, the vaccinated frontline workers in the audience, and the millions of frontline heroes around the world. So this was Harry at Vax Live um, at some big stadium in California somewhere, Inglewood, I think, in California, where um, he was joined by lots of other uh, celebs and singers and uh, Megan wasn't there we're told that Megan will be in the broadcast when it goes out but she wasn't on stage with him obviously clearly at the moment very heavily pregnant in any case so um, uh, we still don't know the the, the due date of um, their second child their first daughter but um, Megan will be in that video and this this Vax live event kind of neatly tying in with with Archie's birthday yeah, we know that she's due with their daughter. Uh, all we know is that uh, she's due in the in the summer. Um, but in a in a message they released on Archwell this afternoon, they said that they have been deeply touched over the past two years to feel the warmth and support for our family in honour of Archie's birthday. Many of you donate to charities on his behalf and mark the occasion by giving back or doing an act of service all through the goodness of your hearts. You raise funds for those who need it most and continually do so organically and selfish, selflessly. We remain incredibly grateful. So uh, We have been deeply touched over the past two years to feel the warmth and support for your family. The honour, I had to add a U in uh, my oh, tweet because they've it. got honour. Oh, I've got a U in I, I left it. Americanized. <laughs> um, uh, yes. Um, but whilst Megan has been busy being a first time mom, she's also have... managed to become an author. She did, yes. She has uh, written her first children's book uh, called The Bench, and this is inspired by the relationship that uh, she has seen with, of Prince Harry and their son, Archie, and she initially wrote it as a poem for Harry on Father's Day, just the month after Archie was born, and she's sort of developed that poem and now into this children's book. Yeah, as she says, that poem became this story, didn't it? And, and now there's some talk about The Bench being... Uh, being very similar to another book. Did you see that stuff on social media about someone else who'd written a book, a children's book called, it wasn't quite called The Bench, wasn't it? I forget called, quite what it was called. Um, it's called The Boy on the Bench. Uh, the Boy on the Bench, that's right, yes. It's written yeah. by someone called uh, Corrine 
Avaris, and there was a lot of chatter on social media that uh, that you know Megan had uh, sort of replicated this book, but the author has actually come out on Twitter saying that yeah, exactly. she doesn't see any I similarities mean, at all. Yeah, so, of course. So, so if the if the author of the Boy on the Bench um, is saying there isn't anything, I was just reading up the tweet here. So, reading the description says Corinne Avaris or Avaris and published excerpt of the Duchess's new book. This is not the same story or the same theme as The Boy on the Bench. I don't see any similarity. So I think that should probably be the end of that discussion because the other author says it ain't similar. And uh, we also got today, lots of the royal family, as they would do for any other birthdays, posted yeah. on their panels to say, to wish Archie, a very happy birthday but what so here's the one from the royal family let's go through them this is the one from the royal family um here is the one from the archie's grandfather prince of wales and duchess of cornwall and here is the one from william and kate yeah lots their of nephew. Pictures, um the uh pictures from the christening uh on the the kensington one and the clarence house one weren't they um but yes. what do you think the queen the queen got him a waffle maker for christmas how do you beat a waffle maker <laughs> How do you beat a waffle maker? Yeah, what's the next thing up from a waffle maker? I mean, could it be a so something very British, like a sort of um, a toasted sandwich maker, or a <laughs> or a, a, a barbecue to have in the garage when it rains too much? Or I mean, he's two. <laughs> I don't think he'll be barbecuing just yet. Barbecuing, no. But what, organic waffle maker. For, well, it wasn't the, the the waffle maker wasn't organic. It was the waffle mix that went inside the waffle, the waffle, waffle maker. Yeah, that was we organic. know that. <laughs> right. Um, now we spent some time um, on a sort of Zoom call or Teams call, a bit like this, listening to the High Court this week. Um, you haven't heard the last of Meghan versus the Mail on Sunday, so we're going to do a very quick, quick recap of what happened. Uh, do you want to do that, Lizzie, or me? I can do that. So this is all to do with the case against the men on Sunday over the publication of that letter that Meghan wrote to her father. And so earlier this year, a summary judgment was granted in relation to the privacy claim and um, as well as a lot of the copyright claim. And basically a summary judgment means that it doesn't have to go to trial and the judge uh, just makes a decision. We now, this week, he uh, he granted a summary judgment in relation to the uh, outstanding issues of the copyright claim after right, lawyers yeah. acting on behalf of the Queen and also um, Jason Canal, her former communication secretary, both said, we had nothing to do with the letter. Right. The copyright is all Meghan's. Right, and the reason why this was an issue was because Meghan, through the court's case, it, it transpired that Meghan had shared a draft of this letter, which she wrote in the note application on her iPhone, shared that draft electronically with the communication secretary at the time, Jason Canal. And therefore, the man on Sunday were arguing, well, the copyright is also theirs, not just Megan. Megan's not the sole author of this letter. Megan then hand wrote the letter um, after she was happy with what she um, had written. But the judge, um, again, not only found in favour of Megan on privacy, as he did earlier this year, he's now found favour on Megan, favour for Megan on copyright. And that means that Megan's not only got the 90% of her costs for the summary judgment, she's got the 10% as well. Um, so this has cost the Mail on Sunday quite a bit of money. And this is just the costs. And the damages are all meant to be connected to, well, did your newspaper sales go up? And how many clicks did you get online on the Mail Online? And that's something they've still got to argue over. And uh, the Mail on Sunday's lawyers were saying this week, weren't they? That's it's a very, very complicated process to try and work out what sort of monetary gain we got from this particular story. Yeah, so uh, while we've we've had uh, another decision this week, it's not quite over yet. They have, uh, they have gone <laughs> away. More. There will be more. There will be more. Anyway, we'll bring you that uh, that more when it happens, of course, as you would um, expect. We've covered them all this week, haven't we? Um, we haven't seen, oh, we've seen the Queen. We haven't done, talked about the Queen. Before we go then, a couple of pictures um, of the Queen who gave another virtual audience. She was at Windsor Castle, her ambassadors, one was from the Vatican, one was from another country in the world somewhere. And um, she uh, held her virtual audiences for those new ambassadors in their positions. Um, so that's what she was doing this week. Um, and we also know that she will be out and about on the 11th of May for the state opening of the Houses of Parliament. Yep, uh, as is uh, as is tradition, um, but... In dangerous. 
Sorry? In day dress, not the state robes. I thought you said dangerous. And I was like, why? Day dress and no crown on the head either. No, and uh, it'll all be scaled back, obviously, like everything is because of COVID. But I suspect this will be the first time that we see her um, outside of palace walls since uh, since Prince Philip yeah. passed away. And in the meantime, we've got to go away and work out how we can get Mila to meet Kate and Anton Deck and have Kate in a pink dress. OK, that, that's this afternoon's yeah. challenge. Yeah, I tell you, that, that, that's your task. This is your producer challenge for the next week. Oh, wow. <laughs> we'll, keep you, we'll keep you updated next week. Thanks for listening.